an investigation into child sexual abuse among Jehovah's Witnesses and accusations that religious leaders led a cover-up within some of the group's 14,000 U.S. congregations. Jehovah's Witnesses are coming under fire for allowing a convicted child molester to go door to door on their behalf. Jehovah's Witness who says she was molested by a fellow church member. And that the church has been protecting pedophiles within their midst. This is the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses, knowing his past, allowed Ivory to go door to door on behalf of the religious group. The instructions were you keep these pedophiles secret, secret, secret. What was the reason that the congregation was not notified? We don't make that public to the congregation. It's confidential. Today we're going to do the Watchtower ritual. Secret. In the names and letters of the Great Western Quadrangle, I invoke the angels of the Watchtowers of the West. In the names and letters of the Great Southern Quadrangle, I invoke the angels of the Watchtowers of the South. Secret. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Occult Rejects with your hosts Lux and the NY Patriot. And today we have a really cool episode for everyone. We have a guest one. Uh, this was a fan of ours who actually reached out and um, he is a whistleblower from the Jehovah Witness Church. And uh, he's seen some really crazy things. He shared it with us and his story was so incredible and compelling that we really wanted to have him on as a guest. I don't think Lux had known as much as I did about the pedo stuff. You know, I think he was a little bit more surprised about that. Um, I had known that that was an issue with the church, but um, the re reason why it ended up on the re occult rejects, though, is that I had no idea, and I don't think Lux did until Jack brought it to us and we started looking at it, um, how much of an occult influence the Jehovah's Witnesses have in their beliefs and teachings. So uh, I would just like to add that before we start the series. Um, it's an amazing series, and, uh, you know, uh, I really want everybody to thank, you know, Jack as, mu as much as us for putting this out. He, uh, I think it took a lot of courage for him to come out and do what he did. But, um, Definitely. Yeah. But, like, I, I want to add, though, like, you know, uh, the reason it is on here, besides the pedophilia, is because uh, we do believe there is an occult influence within that, uh, that belief system. For sure. And I, like you had said, I didn't really know much about them at all. Uh, there's so many of those, you know, like, like, for example, the Loyal Order of the Moose. We didn't even know that they like, still existed. <laughs> I didn't you know, know they were bowling either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And so, like, it's crazy. So for our listeners, again, if, if any of you out there are from a, a church or a group or a cult or a secret society and you feel like you want to get your message out, you know, reach out to us just like he did. Cause this is incredible stuff. Yes. Yeah. And I can't thank him anymore for doing what he did. Oh, and this week I've been wanting to give out uh shout outs. I've forgotten to put a couple of these people in here from the past, but uh, we do have some fans like we try to do that need to reach out to us. So they're are they're active in our group. There is one member who is extremely active in our gab group that uh, didn't want to shout out. I'm not going to mention their name, but I know you listen to all our stuff because you always comment and add. Uh, I'm talking about you anyway. I'm just not going to throw your name out there. Thank you for everything you do. Um, we also want to thank Felix the Cat, uh, LaToya, Snow White, um, Question for Everything, uh, Esoteric Gladiator Podcast, another great show, great dude. I suggest to go look up their stuff. He's going to be coming on my own show also. Uh, 
you know, he's great. The guy has great stuff to say. We thank you. And uh, we also have uh, Rosie from Queens. I'm giving a shout out to. Uh, so, yeah, didn't want to th- uh, forget about you. Um, plus all our other fans and listeners, we thank you so much for, you know, all the, all the comments, all the, you know, hitting us up, telling us great work, all that stuff. We appreciate it and we don't forget. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we have a group on Gab. You can come there, and if you have any stuff, you can always add to the posts of our shows that I put up. So that's another way to get involved if there's people out there who want to add to what we have. And uh, I guess we'll leave it there, and uh, here we'll start it up with Jack. Today we have uh, the pleasure of a special guest. We're really excited to have one. His name is Jack Pine. And uh, he is a former member of Jehovah Witness. Uh, I guess you were an official member. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was, I was born into it. Um, my dad, he was actually a hippie. And he, he liked the idea that they were presenting him about uh, peace and a paradise earth. And so that's how he kind of got sucked into it. And my mom, she was born into it. Uh, so at this point, I'm like a third generation in. Wow. Oh, very so this was something that you had, uh, even from just your earliest memories of growing up in the church. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, my parents were considered very faithful to it. And um, I, they, I just grew up that way. And so to me, all the things that, that they were saying is as crazy as they're going to sound um, as we go on. It, to a Jehovah's Witness that grows up in it, it's just completely normal. Okay. Well, would you mind go ahead and and maybe sort of take us through those early years of sort of what that was, what that was like up until maybe you know eighteen or so, maybe when you went to to college or or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, like I said, I grew up in it, and at the time, I I really believed it. Like I was a true believer in it. Um, there were some things I, I kind of had questions about and wasn't quite sure, um, given the explanation. And it didn't quite make sense, but uh, you kind of learn as you go through it to, to toe the line, so to speak. Because if you don't, um, there, you're going to run into problems where people uh, will look at you I don't know, as being spiritually weak or somebody who's a possible danger to the congregation. So even if they t- give you an explanation and you don't agree with it, most just go along with it to not just make waves. Okay. I See, I we have a kind of a similar story in the fact that both grew up uh, in, in a church. And I remember for me, it was like you would go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays and, you know, Sunday nights. And uh, my family was relatively devoted. Was it a similar experience for you or I guess for the listeners, how does how is Jehovah Witnesses, how is it different of a belief system um, than sort of say Christianity? Oh, yeah, it's extremely different. Um, they do consider themselves Christian because they, they believe in Jesus, um, but they don't believe that Jesus is God and they don't believe in a trinity. So they believe Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God, who they, they call Jehovah, they believe that there are three different things instead of like one triune God. And so for us uh, growing up in it, at the time there were uh, three different meetings a week. So it could have been on Tuesday or Wednesday nights. They had a, what they call a theocratic ministry school. Basically they teach you how to do public speaking. Um, so I, you know, wow. at some point I was getting on stage and giving sermons or doing a Bible reading from the stage. So I, I just got used to it. And uh, although no matter what, your nerves are always kind of shot, you know, just hearts racing before you get up there. But so um, uh, now, do you, was, now was, was that was that you think? Now, what was the reasoning behind them teaching that? Was that so you can go out and preach the word to people? Yeah, exactly. Wow. They just they wanted to get. It's a way to help recruit like new members in. Uh, and so the way it's presented is. If you're going to be a Jehovah's Witness, you have to go out and service. Like, that's one of your duties is to go. Back then, it was to go door to door, or you might run into somebody on the street, and they call that street witnessing. 
Um, but in more modern times, uh, they're doing that cart witnessing. So you see them out on a street corner or at an airport or in front of a building. And they just have a cart and basically wait for people to walk up to them now. But back then, it used to be um, pretty aggressive at some points. Like uh, in the old days, more like in the 50s, like they would stick their foot in the door and not let the door shut because they're like, hey, I got an important message I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> so people, people used to get pretty nasty. And I've definitely had people slam the door in my face or yell at me or just, just to try and get us away. You know, they'd say, I worship Satan. I don't want to talk to you, you know, stuff like that. You know, I find weird with that. Even like, let's say even if you were still horrible at it, I think the fact of you going and taking classes like that is just reinforcing more and more. Uh, yeah, definitely. It, I mean, let me put it this way. If I was out uh, handing out pamphlets for the OTO and I'm just, this isn't putting you <laughs> down or anything. If I right, was right. doing that at one point, I think they could successfully uh, say, uh, this motherfucker's a sheep. You know what I'm saying? I mean, now the OTO is a little bit more drastic, I think, and be a lot harder to present than a Jehovah's Witness. But at that point, if I'm out and I'm doing that and I've taken classes to be able to go out and promote this idea, they should know that I'm, I'm pretty well controlled. Right. At that point. Uh, you know, and funny. I think that sends a, says a lot. And I'm not putting you down because you were in that position. You know what I'm saying? So please yeah, don't, no, don't no, take no, it that way point. at all. I just think that they know that if that's just another way to, uh, to conf- enforce uh, the, the, the ideology that they have. Right. No, I totally agree. It's funny that you use the word sheep. Is at one point they, they used to call those who do it sheep. And the ones who weren't witnesses, they would kind of refer to them as goats. So the sheep and the goats. And But uh, it depends on how much you want to look at that symbolically. But I, I kind of think you're on the right track there. Yo, that's actually mm. kind of messed up. That's almost like one of those things where it's like in magic when they, they tell you the truth. But, like, you just don't understand the way they're saying it. Like, almost right there, they could be telling you, like, um, you guys are being manipulated. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, just, I mean, and, and, and up, not even realizing it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they, they actually refer, um, I can't remember the exact scripture, but you probably saw it on that, that Vice documentary uh, where they refer to people as good-for-nothing slaves, and that's how Jehovah's Witnesses are meant to think about themselves. And wow. so, if, yeah, yeah, I mean, if that's not cultish, I don't know what is. <laughs> And I guess, at least in my experience with growing up in the church, it's, you know, for, and I'm sure that a bunch of different groups do this for various different reasons, but yeah, you're sort of forced to, you know, learn to public speak and to to share this message with the people around you, even though it's extremely uncomfortable, especially at a young age. And it's sort of like they're sharpening the sword for you in, in the future to go out and carry out this message. Like they're training you at a very early age to perfect the message so that when you get out into, you know, the real world sort of on your own, that one, you don't second guess a lot of things that you've been taught, but two, that you're really good at saying them to people who don't know sort of your belief system. What age did you have to start to do the, like the preaching and the, the witnessing or, or going out and sharing like that message? Uh, actually, since the moment for most witnesses, it's pretty much the moment it's they're born. Their parent, you'll see parents pushing the kids in a stroller um, just in the ministry. And like my dad had one experience. Uh, I was real. I was probably like around one or two. He's pushing me in a stroller you know, people don't like Jehovah's Witnesses, some of them. And this guy let his dog, like, come after us. And so <laughs> the dog ended up um, coming after me. But my dad took the brunt of it. And I ended up okay. But my dad, you know, got a bite. And they were able to get the dog off. But, you know, people people can just be nasty when, when a belief system is challenged. But it's a two-way street. You know, witnesses can be just as nasty. I, I've definitely had that experience myself. Hmm. So is there like any identifying like clothing or something? That's curious. How did the guy know that you guys were witnesses? Uh, you can kind of tell. Uh, the women will be in a dress. Uh, like if it's Mormons, they only have like their Mormon elders that will go. And it's generally a white shirt, black tie. But witnesses, uh, they're told to wear a full suit if 
you know, if within reason, like it's not 110 degrees outside. Okay, you know, that, that's that's how we morning. always knew when it was uh, them coming down the road. It's because they were always, right, right. Uh, yeah, they were dressed to the nines. Oh, okay. <laughs> So it sounds like, I mean, would you say that you had a pretty good, even though it was in the church and, and everything and, you know, you had some of those bad experiences with, you know, people and, and their opinions of you guys, but would you say that just generally like childhood was a, you had a good childhood and you didn't feel as though you at a very young age saw anything incredibly strange or weird that might make you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. For example, like seeing uh, some physical abuse or, or anything like that in uh, any of the members of the church? Uh, my personal childhood, I, I look at it, at it fondly. Like I, my parents were great to me, That's good. Uh, but there were definitely ones that I felt went too far. Um, they, you know, they, sometimes they would give a kid a wooden spoon and he was forced to walk up the aisle. And so everybody knew he was going to get a spanking. Um, you might hear a kid screaming from the bathroom, you know, bloody murder. And, not necessarily the, that the parents are actually like hurting them really bad. Uh, I guess it depends on who you talk to, uh, but they would just be getting a spanking. And so you could, you could hear it, but for other little kids, um, including my wife, you know, she heard some pretty disturbing things and it's traumatizing for little kids. So it kind of sets it up early. Like you're supposed to sit there quietly, don't interrupt, you know, pay attention, write notes, you know, whatever your parents are telling you to do uh, to pay attention to the program. So it's, uh, I don't know, I had a cousin who almost got in a fight with somebody that was being a little too rough with his kids. And he is, he had just kind of come into his own as an adult, you know, 18 years old. He's kind of had a chip on his shoulder and saw some guy about to start hitting his kid and just stopped him and said, hey, that's not going to happen. Not here not in front of me because if not, so, you and I are going to go outside. <laughs> so, so if you're a, a member of the church, let's say you and I both go to the same church, I could discipline your kids without you knowing it. Uh, no, no, okay. I would say not maybe in the old days. Um, I'd say more in the fifties, it could have been, you know, when spankings were considered like an appropriate thing. Um, but now it's not so much. Uh, but there are there are a lot of people that that did go through that. I would say probably within my parents' generation, probably saw stuff more like that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's so, great. <laughs> so, uh, sort of, kind of, what's the next step of the story? You know, you sounds like you had a really good childhood and things were relatively okay and then sort of what was the next phase did you go away to college it was like a certain college that you had to go to for witnesses or sort of what was the next step after like you hit 18 uh, actually for myself uh, I got married when I was 18 and it was I hate to say it but you know you're 18 and you're just you're a horny teenager and the only <laughs> way <laughs> only way you can have sex you know to the to the witnesses as if you get married. And so unfortunately there's so many that, that do get married for, for that reason. Oh, and, man. you know, you think you're in love, you know, when you're that young, but you know, you still have no idea who you are at 18 years old. Um, so and unfortunately it, it happens, but um, uh, for me, uh, I ended up seeing back Actually, probably when I was 16, uh, there was a friend of my parents, a young couple that had gotten married, and she had, had uh, confided in them and said that she had been abused by her father, and it had come out that it was actually uh, ritual abuse that was going on. And so for myself, immediately, that kind of puts a hole in the theology for me because if somebody's to get baptized, they have to go through a series of questions. And basically, the elders have to see that you're in total agreement with what the organization is presenting informationally. And if that's so, then they pray on it. And if it's a yes, then that means supposedly that the Holy Spirit has blessed that person to come in into the fold, so to speak. Um, so that made me really question, like, hey, is Holy Spirit actually working? Because how could this guy become a witness and also be in some, you know, satanic cult or whatever group he was in, but 
and he's ritually abusing his daughter and members of whatever group that was were also abusing his daughter. So when I started really questioning things and started looking into uh, satanic ritual abuse, and of course you know, people kind of looked down on that idea, but from what I saw and from her personalities that actually came out, um, she had DID or multiple personalities. And when I saw that come out, I think, know, I I think that happens real. a lot because of SRA, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, totally. And if, so, if it's uh, real or legit. But I think, I think um, you know, we covered a person called Kim Noble. The lady had a ridiculous amount of personalities, and she claims satanic ritual abuse. That seems to be a common thing. Yeah. Oh, poor thing. That, yeah, that's horrific. I can't even imagine having to go through that. But it's amazing that your brain will fracture that way, like just to protect itself so you don't completely snap. But it, it's, right. it sucks that they figured that out and, you know, they're abusing people that way. Uh, not it too, was uh, it, so, sorry. Actually, Good, New York Patriot? Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think we were <laughs> kind of almost went to zero to 100 in like 15 minutes. There was other stuff I wanted to try to maybe touch on before we start getting into like that other stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. I did want to actually find out more. Well, there's two things now, and you did bring up one of them that I'm glad you did. One, I want you to go over the baptisms, because I, I heard that that's actually, and from what I listen to, it seems like it's pretty entailed. Like, you're actually agreeing to a lot of things. And uh, two, I also wanted to know, like, you mentioned that you had this speaking thing that you would go to. Now, like, what other things uh, was it expected for you to do that maybe wasn't... Um, congregation specific that you could go over like is there like separate nights or days like are you always expected to be there and like if so like what kind of class is that there's just more a little bit about like what they're trying to teach you yeah so let's see well they used to have uh what was called a uh, book study and that used to be held at somebody's home um so you might get a group of like 10 or you know, 10 to 20 people maybe um, in that group. And then uh, that was once a week for an hour. And then on the weekend, either Saturday or Sunday, just depending on what congregation you were in, um, they would have like a public talk, which is 45 minutes. And then they would go over their watchtower study. And so their watchtower, uh, they consider it like <laughs> spiritual food so to speak. Gotcha. So actually anything that comes from the governing body or the organization, they consider it to be spiritual food. So, but for the most part, it wasn't. And they're handing that out to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So, and that's usually. So it's uh, like they're always... dispensing the spiritual food onto you people. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I'm, like, again, I'm not trying to like, you know, make it sound bad. No, <laughs> you no, know, don't to worry. You, to you. I don't know. Please don't take it that way. No, no, no. Hey, it's really hard to defend. You guys are good. Don't worry about it. I mean, listen. I, 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 was, I was eating. I was eating people. cakes. Of, I was eating. <laughs> I was eating cakes of light in the OTO, so I can't be saying much. <laughs> yeah, you know, know what I'm saying? I'll admit to it. And I, and I, <laughs> and I fucking love them. So, <laughs> so listen, I'm not. I'm not putting you down at all, man. Did you ever have uh, Bible studies? Uh, where you would go, I, this was something really popular in the church I grew up in, where you would, they would give you a book that you would study from the Bible, and then you would have to go to these, like, sort of these com competitions of where you would have to answer certain biblical questions. Did you guys ever have any, something like that? No, not, not really. Um, but the whole goal, like, for their ministry, though, is to start a Bible study, and so that's generally once you start a study, they'll uh, back when I was in my day, they called it the knowledge book. And then eventually it went to um, what does the Bible really teach? But they're basically the same book. Just there's a little bit of information either added or taken out or they'll call it uh, like the spiritual light has gotten brighter. So you might get new information that comes out and a new publication. So I'm not sure uh, what book they're offering now to, to Bible students. But, uh, but like I said, that was the whole goal is everybody that's out in service knocking on doors or that you meet at the carts, they're trying to start a Bible study with you. And it, it is for the goal of converting you to a witness eventually. 
They don't like do any stuff out in the public or anything. You know, like how like we've covered other other things and like you know the Shriners are out there always doing something or you know the Moose Lodge might be doing something out in the public. They, they don't really do stuff like that, right? Uh, not a whole lot. Sometimes uh, when there's like a big disaster, uh, like when Hurricane Katrina happened, um, they did have people to go out there and like supplies would be sent in from the organization but it was specifically to help other witnesses. And there are cases where they do help people who aren't, but to be honest, it's pretty rare. And so they try and keep it like within the organization itself. Like any kind of charity is just going to be for witnesses and not, not to anyone else. Oh, gotcha. So as far as the view inside of the church, was there like a language about the, the way that they characterize people who were not witnesses? So um, did they, they view themselves as better than sort of ordinary people or how did, what was the view of the uninitiated? <laughs> Anybody who's not a witness, they would call a worldly person. So automatically right there, there's that dividing line. It's, it's us against them. It's funny how some people will say I'm a worldly person to make themselves sound good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, normally it's like, yeah, they're well-traveled or they're well-versed in something, you know, uh, whatever it is. But yeah, they, they put a bad spin on it for sure. Wow. You can kind of see the, the language that's used in the group. Um, usually high control groups or, or cults, if you want to call it that, um, they will change the language uh, for, for certain things. And like just that in itself, it's uh, just another control mechanism, really. If, if you think about it, it's something that should be good. They're turning it upside down and making it a bad thing. And so there, there is a very different language within the Jehovah's Witness organization so you're right when you were asking that. There definitely is. Well, I mean, that's funny. Like, even in the in the OTO, I mean, we, people have, like, their own lingo that anybody outside of it would have no idea what the fuck it even means, you know, or phrases do. Yeah. Yeah, so I find that interesting. And, and what it was, uh, if you don't mind going over it, um, what was, like, the baptism kind of, like, what's that experience? And, like, what is it, like, in, is theirs different? Uh, yeah, so... There's some churches that might have like, uh, what do you call it? Like a deliverance kind of day where it's anybody can come and they want to baptize as many people, like just try and bring people to Jesus kind of thing. Witnesses don't do that. Although they do want you to be baptized, you cannot get baptized in that organization unless you're in complete agreement with the series of questions that they go over with you. Uh, that's um, what I wanted. Yeah, I was hoping you'd be able to touch upon that. Yeah. It, honestly, so it, it reminded me a lot of the OTO in, in some ways. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, gosh, it's been a long time. It's been over 20 years for me since I went over those. But uh, it's basically the just witness theology. And, you know, but, but I do know at some point they'll ask, like, do you believe that the governing body is – you know, Jehovah's Spirit directed organization or their their guiding Jehovah's Spirit directed organization. And so when you come into agreement with that, you're basically saying whatever they say goes. Yeah. And so Is that's the, actually really scary if you think about it, like with what you guys know now and what you've seen, it's uh it's witnesses are completely brainwashed to whatever they hear those men say. And so if it's like, don't listen to, you know, any negative comments about us, like not even within the own organization, just people talking. If you're mentioning anything bad about it, you're supposed to stop and walk away from it now. It's, it's gotten kind of extreme, really extreme, actually. Yeah, for- what age were you baptized at? I got baptized at 16. Okay. Um, there's no requirement. They... They do say they want you to get baptized whenever you feel that you're ready to be baptized. Um, but the, the parents are supposed to let the parents know what kind of a commitment they're making. And they actually take it just as seriously as somebody getting married, um, if not more so. 
because you're really never allowed to walk away from it. Hmm. Hmm. Was, was there a sort of like an age, because they always had this thing in, in the church that I grew up in, which is called age of accountability. So, you know, you couldn't get baptized at, let's say, eight, because you had to realize the full implications of the baptism and, and realizing sin and what you do is right and wrong. Is there sort of a similar belief system, or could you kind of get baptized literally at the age of 10? Yeah, they, they, it's, it's odd. They used to discourage, like, little kids getting baptized um, just because they, they don't know, you know, the weight of the decision that they're making at that time. Um, recently, uh, in the last, I'd say the last few years, it's come up where uh, the old teaching used to be God can read your heart. And so even if somebody's not a witness or wasn't baptized, they would have a chance to be resurrected or be in, on the paradise earth. But now the governing body has come out and said, the only way to make it is if you're a baptized Jehovah's witness. And so because of that, um, you know, I follow a lot of private like Jehovah's witness accounts on social media and I'm seeing little kids like eight, nine years old getting baptized and they have wow. no idea, you know, once they come into their own, you know, you become a teenager, you sleep with your girlfriend, you know, more than likely they're going to get disfellowships and they're going to lose, you know, their social structure. And that's a really devastating thing. It affects you mentally and emotionally really bad. So it, unfortunately they don't realize the implications that are, that are going to come. Right. Cause it's essentially you're agreeing to an oath as a child that you aren't able to comprehend. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Did you go to a, a regular school, like a public school, or do Jehovah's Witnesses, do they have certain schools that you're supposed to go to, like private schools? No. Um, I mean, there might be some private schools out there, but nothing that's, like, pushed by the organization itself. It's normally somebody who's just a uh, – uh, just they decided to make a private school and they're selling the idea to other witnesses in, you know, the surrounding areas for different congregations. So you had a lot of friends growing up and stuff that weren't involved in the church and things like that then. Well, I did go to regular, uh, I went to public school, um, but you're discouraged uh, very much so uh, from making any friendships outside of the religion. So it's, it's more considered people at school or just acquaintances. They're not really your friend. And because of what the church teaches or the, what the organization tells its members is, you know, these are potentially, you know, they're part of Satan's world. So you need to be very careful, you know, what you do with them because they might tempt you into sinning in some one way or another. You know, if for kids, it might be like, uh, well, they, they might have you eat birthday cake and, you know, kids would freak out. It's, <laughs> it's, it gets uh. ridiculous, <laughs> it gets ridiculous but, but then just an example, you know, but, um, for me, I grew up with a lot of friends in the organization and some people I'm still friends with, you know, to this day. Um, but a lot of them that if they knew what I was doing, uh, they would cut me off immediately. Wouldn't be my friend anymore. Oh, yeah. Wow, so, so it's a really cut and dry thing. Then it's there's no. It doesn't sound like there's any gray in in between there. No, no, not really. Yeah. So, like, I was going to say, like, is there any interesting um, things about you know the, your I guess the Jehovah Witness religion that a lot of people like don't know? Like, not to get into the. Um, a pedophilia type stuff that we're going to get into, but I'm sure a lot of people don't know about the two witness rule or um, just like certain things people might be surprised about. Be like, Oh, I didn't know. Like I know in some aspects they're not as bad as Scientology, but they don't want you going online, looking anybody up at all. Right. Uh, for the most part. Yeah. They, at least any information about religion. Um, like I had a conversation with my boss who's a witness and the, the topic of Scientology came up from him. And I think he, he asked, he goes, I, I don't know who, after L. Ron Hubbard, who, who took over Scientology. And I said, oh, it's a guy named Miscavige. And he looked at me like wide-eyed and he kind of, you know, we we're in the same vehicle and he kind of like, 
kept his distance away from me like he was shocked. And he's like, why do you know that? You had the cooties after that. Look- Yeah, like, what are you looking at? And I was wow. like, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they freak out about it, honestly. Uh, some more Shit. so than others. He was about to put but, a mask yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> if it was if it was recent day, man, he might have put a mask on too. Got all nervous. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, unfortunately, yeah, they, they definitely pushed the mask thing real hard. Yeah, see now, I, I thought that was interesting too. You said they 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 closed real quick with that too, right? With yeah, the- yeah. Um, once it was, you know, whatever state, I don't remember the exact date that it happened. But when states started saying, you know, no more public meetings and they saw that other churches were getting shut down, um, they closed their doors immediately and told everybody to go on Zoom meetings. And so that's how they're doing their, you know, everything, Watchtower study, their theocratic ministry school, um, all of those meetings are done online now. So they're not even meeting in public or, or they don't even get the association of a face-to-face meeting. They're, they're keeping all the members extremely scared about COVID. Um, the last official number I heard was like 19,000 witnesses died of COVID from what they're, the organization is telling. So um, it's just, it's something else to keep them in fear. You know, and you guys know yeah. if people are, are in fear, like you can't think logically. So yes, it's, yeah. I think it's all done on purpose myself. Yeah. Hey, that's definitely kind of, uh, threw me off a little bit to hear that because based on just what I've read, it seems as though the witnesses don't really recognize government as being sort of their governing body, right? They almost believe as though they're totally independent and, and away from the worldly things. So it's just it's strange to me that they would you know, take the, the mask mandate and the vaccine so seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like one of the the cases I will get into later, but yeah, they were charging like $4,000 a day to produce records of uh, known uh, perpetrators against children or you call them pedophiles, but uh, they refused to do so or gave an excuse that they couldn't. And so the the judge, you know, charged them $4,000 a day until they did it. And it ended up being almost $2 million by the, the time it was done because they refused to hand those records over. So it really makes you wonder what is it, you know, to, to actually be able to pay $2 million. What are you hiding? That's so terrifying for you to pay that sum of money. So it should really make the public think. And hopefully if any members hear that, you know, I hope that they really think about what, what that means because it's not just, it's your children too. You know, it could have been your wife, your sister, it could have been your son, you know, you got to think about, about that. Very good. Yeah. I mean, since we're getting close to, I guess, uh, some of the other stuff we're going to go into, would you like to just quickly explain the whole two person rule? Yeah. So there's, there's a scripture that they use saying that unless there's two witnesses to a crime or to maybe something that's just considered a sin or a wrongdoing in the witness organization, it won't be taken seriously unless there's two people who have witnessed it. So if there's an accusation that's made, they may question you, but they won't enforce anything unless you confess to it or there's two people that saw you do a particular act. So whether it be, you know, smoking a cigarette or they saw you, you know, cheating on your wife, or, you know, something as horrible as pedophilia. But to me, you know, it's, if you got two, two pedophiles in the same room with a kid, I think you have a way bigger problem than you, than you realize, you know, for that two witness rule. So, or you just got to hope that a parent walks in on something happening. But I mean, if that would happen, you know, what person wouldn't kill, kill that person, honestly, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh. So I'm, I'm pretty curious about, you know, what was, what was that next step? It sounds like, you know, you were in, in the church for pretty much your entire adolescent years. What sort of happened after that? What happened when you turned like 18? Did you go to college or anything like that? Or uh, Well, I'd gotten, like I said earlier, I'd gotten married 
and we're married for a number of years. And unfortunately, you know, you get married that young and you don't really know who you are. And we just kind of started growing apart from each other. Um, and in doing so, I, you know, she got busy with the ministry work. So she was doing what they call pioneering. And which means I was, I was doing the bulk of uh, the supporting work. You know, you know, I was the one doing the job. I mean, she worked too, but she was, went to part-time to pursue more spiritual things. They call it um, going out in the ministry. And so I, tr- I tried supporting her in that, but um, in doing so, it, it just was never enough. And it, it wasn't from her that it wasn't enough, but the way the organization uh, puts pressure on all of its members is to, to we need more. Like you can always give more kind of the thing, you know, Jehovah wants your best, you know, why aren't you giving him your best? Give us more time in the ministry, um, help out more around the kingdom hall, or maybe, you know, go to kingdom hall builds do you know, just different avenues to reach out and your service to God is how they put it. And so eventually, um, you know, it affected her because she was doing that. And she was like, you know, I think we should do more. And I was kind of at my wits end. And I was like, I'm doing everything I can to support you in this ministry. Um, I'm not asking you to work full time, but, you know, I refuse to feel bad about what I'm not doing. And I'm going to be happy about what I am doing for it because I felt like I was doing a lot. But according to them, like you can always do more. So it's a constant, you know, guilt trip that's on you. Doesn't Scientology so, pull that a lot too on their people? It's like almost the same thing, right? Uh, I've heard similar, yeah, similar things. I'm sure they spin it a little different, but yeah, not not to get Scientology after me too. It's the last thing. I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I well, wanted, def- uh, definitely not to pile on even another one, but yeah. Mormonism is one that does it too. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, now you've done it. That's actually something I've mentioned about looking into also with luck. So who knows? That might be an episode one day. Um, yeah, if you yeah, don't. I, Got a crazy story about that. I'll, I'll stay on topic, but I'll tell you guys about it later. But, if you um, don't mind me asking, what is what is pioneering? Yeah, I was going to ask that, and and I wanted to know also uh, if you can, uh, what kind of stuff like was your wife doing? Is was there different things for males and females, or you know, or like what kind of stuff was your wife uh, into with helping out in service? Oh, it's just it's the same thing, like just oh, going out stuff. in service. It was yeah, door to door. Sometimes business witnessing, you know, just talking to people just that you meet on the street. Um, you might run into somebody like they're taught to look for opportunities. Um, maybe somebody had mentions in passing, like, you know, they had a relative pass away. And if you feel that it's a good opportunity or it's appropriate, then maybe you should mention something about, you know, if there is a way you could see them again, like, would you want to know that? And if it strikes their interest, then you get into Bible discussion and talk about them, seeing, seeing them resurrected on, on a paradise earth, something along those lines. That's a good, um, that's a good hook, though. Not to say, you know, right? not to say, but that's a good hook right there. Yeah, well, yeah. No, what's some of the other ones? What's some, is there, other, <laughs> is there other, uh, other examples you could give that they would say is an opportune time to bring up Jehovah? Oh, you know what? There is a, there is a book they have. And actually, I don't think they use it anymore. Um, it's out of print now, but it was called Reasoning from the Scriptures. And it's an entire book of basically comebacks for conversation stoppers that people oh, wow. might present. So it's basically, you know, sales tactics to, <laughs> to use to use on on the public. See, that's interesting. Now, you said that, right, they don't use the book anymore. But at one point, I'm assuming when they did use the book, maybe they also had... Um those classes. So they really prepped or used to prep people to go out there and uh, pitch this. Oh yeah, definitely. That's Yeah. At one time they used to charge for it. Um, like, like for the literature. So if somebody wanted a magazine, like when I was a little kid, I remember them being, they were like 25 or 50 cents, something like that. And eventually they got into trouble. They got named in a lawsuit with a televangelist. I forgot his name. Um, but he was basically, he got in trouble with the IRS because he was taking donations. I I forgot what had happened, but it was some, some kind of trouble with the IRS. So as a technicality, they kind of had to backpedal 
and then say, okay, we're not selling magazines anymore. We're just going to give them away and then ask for a donation if people are so inclined. And so there were different ways that they would do that. And so when they do that, that was one of the other schools that, that we went through um, called the Theo- Theocratic, yeah, Theocratic Ministry School. Um, that was for service. And then there was the Kingdom Ministry School. Jeez. And that was like a second part of the meeting, which was basically more tactics on how to place literature. Is there any, pol- really is there any politicians that come out of this? Because you, um, you can make a real good a, one with all this fucking training. Holy yeah, shit. there was a, um, I don't know how long he was in it. Uh, there was a president. Uh, oh, God, I got to look it up. I, I'll let you know in a oh, second. Yeah, it's a, I, I didn't even expect a yes, actually. So. Yeah, just, yeah, I think, think he was, like with all he was that. raised one, and then he ended up, you know, walking away from, from the organization and then eventually became a U.S. president. But I'll, I'll, I'll give wow. you the name. Interesting. Jack, have you ever heard of a group or an organization called YWAM? YWAM? No, I haven't. Yeah, I, it was a thing that I had done really between the ages of 16 and 18, where I, I more or less had to move to a different location in, in the country and uh, do these outreaches and, and ministry where you would have to talk to people on the street and sort of like spread the, mes- the, the message of Christianity. It sounds really similar to what you just sort of were talking about. So it's just it's funny that just struck up that memory. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of them out there more than most people realize. I, I, part, of, part of what got me second guessing this organization. Um, I eventually had gotten disfellowshipped. Uh, my wife and I had grown apart and I eventually, I, we separated and I ended up with a girlfriend and they found out right away about it. And actually I told them about it because the programming runs so deep, like you feel guilty because you know you're doing something wrong. And so in doing so, they disfellowshipped me. And which is basically the same as being excommunicated. Um, so I was disfellowshipped for about three years. But when that happens, um, it messes with your head really bad. Um, I mean, emotionally, mentally, um, your entire social structure. If you were a, a good witness that only hung out with other witnesses, that's your whole social structure. So now you're no longer allowed to speak to any of those people. Um, you can see them at the kingdom hall, but you still can't speak to them and nobody's allowed to talk to you. So you basically just go in, um, when the song starts, sit down, listen to the program. And then after the closing song, you know, you can leave before everybody gets up and starts associating. Um, so going through that, it was, it was excruciating. And, um, I started looking online for groups, um, that could, like a, any help groups that were out there for it. And in doing so, I ran across uh, some, uh, what they would call apostate information, but it's just really just people who have left and have found, you know, the things that helped them out, or they might have say, hey, you know, the, whatever it might be. Like they talked about, I think one of the things I found was uh, that they were actually involved with the UN um, oh, they wow. were an, yeah, they were an NGO member and the excuse that they had given for it was they needed a library card to have access to the UN's library. Uh, but if you sign the NGO like agreement, you're saying that you agree with the United Nations and you would not put them in a bad light. Um, just wow. general statements like that. But the problem is if you look at their literature, um, at least their old literature, um, they talk about the United Nations being part of the wild beast in the book of Revelation. And so they definitely didn't paint the UN in a good light, but they they eventually got caught. There was an investigative reporter that ended up finding it and kind of blew the lid off. And as soon as he did, um, they with, withdrew their membership and then kind of gave it their own spin. And so there, there are a lot of different things that I, I had come across, and it really made me question question their uh, legitimacy 
as a, at least as a religious organization, the way they paint themselves. That's wild. A lot of the stuff that I've, at least what I've seen, of course, it could be totally not true, but based on the literature that I've been reading about Jehovah Witnesses, that they really try to like separate themselves from governmental systems and sort of what would be, you know, the, the, the Babylon system. That's, that's crazy to me that it would be so closely tied to the UN. Right, yeah, yeah right. that's like and almost I, they contradicts I, themselves right there because because they have. I mean, I was stuff that I was even going to mention later on. I mean, they've been pretty uh, outspoken against government, actually. And right, some, some things that I've seen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, in recent times, um, there's been a lot of persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia, and so Putin has kind of dropped the hammer on them over there. And I, to be honest, I don't know exactly why, um, but from what the media is saying is um, they're just viewed as an extremist religious group. And so they spent it, um, they actually, they got mad and I forgot, they changed something in one of the, like, the prophetic books. And I think they're saying he's like the, or Russia is the king of the north that's mentioned in the Bible. So it plays into biblical prophecy in painting Russia, you know, as a bad guy, scripturally. So mm. that's, yeah, it's, and I, I mean, they did something really similar during World War II uh, with Hitler. And in both cases, they had a letter writing campaign, just asking that you please, you know, withdraw. I don't know exactly how they worded it, but uh, yeah, just trying to get the persecution to stop against its members in those different countries. I had seen they were a couple articles that I had read that the reason why um, the Russian government was going after Jehovah's Witnesses is because they were worried about uh, money laundering. Apparently, oh, that's the excuse, whether it's true or a lie, whatever. That's why they had, had justified that. Oh, okay. So yeah, again, that... take take it with a grain of salt. Right, right. Yeah, I you know after. Uh, after the Australian Royal Commission, um, I was hearing rumors about um, alleged money laundering um, that they closed their, basically withdrew any business that had money out of Australia in case the Australian government was going to try and drop the hammer on them and take it. And I think they moved all their assets uh, legally somewhere else, supposedly legally somewhere else. But, you know, I'm not an attorney. I have no idea. This is all alleged. So I'll, I'll right. just leave it at that. <laughs> Jack, if, if you don't mind, I, I wanted to, I hate to be going backwards, but there was actually uh, something that I heard you said that made me want to ask you a few more questions. Yeah, no. It just, it just, it just struck my mind. And, and when, I, when I go with these questions, I don't want you to take it as me, like, you know, targeting you. Because I, I think it just, I just want to prove kind of like an, uh, uh, a mindset, you know. Um, you mentioned that after you kind of got shunned, you still went back to, to, to the church, though, right? But they can't talk to you? Right. Um, have you seen other people, like, uh, deal with that also and, like, come back while you were there? Yeah, actually, there, yeah, there has been. Um, there were a couple other people that I, that I knew that were in my congregation that were going through the same thing. Um, sure. One just dropped out completely, didn't try and go. One got reinstated uh, before I did, and then I was eventually reinstated. It took me a few years, but I came back. And um, But that person who, who did come back, they're still in. It sounds like they're a full believer because uh, I ended up running into them at a funeral. Um, they call it, a, when it's a witness funeral, they call it a memorial. And I ran into to this person, and, and they know, you know, they just saw my my Facebook account, and they're like, "Oh, you know, interesting Facebook. Um, I can really see where you are as far as your spirituality with Jehovah." And I just, my personal one, I don't say anything about religion or just, you know, it's mostly family stuff or you know, a cat video or something that's you know not going to cause any controversy. Yeah. But I was just. I just kind of took it and I was like, wow, uh, you know, that's really culty. <laughs> that's just, okay, well, nice seeing you. I just walked away from them. But it mm -hmm. just the mindset of everybody in there, it's, I mean, there's some really good people 
And honestly, like I, the majority, I love them. And that's why I come out and I speak about this because I hope one day they can hear it and I hope they can hear how they sound. So this isn't an attack on any like personal Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I don't even have a problem with the belief system um, other than, you know, the shunning and the blood issue. And, uh, you know, we'll get into the the pedophilia stuff, but um, it's just, it makes me sad because when you wake up from it, it feels like you're living in a nightmare and nobody's going to believe what you tell them. And so that's a really hard thing to live with. Yeah, that well, it's something I wanted. I was trying to get at. Now, how long were you, I guess, shunned for that you still went there, and they couldn't talk uh, to you? Oh, uh, it was like three years. So oh, now, wow. see, see, now this is what I. This is actually what I really wanted to get at. Uh, how did you feel while you were there, knowing that these people couldn't talk to you? Oh, uh, it was rough. It was rough. Um, so, so for three years, because of the belief system that they put into you. You went there feeling like shit around people for three fucking years, dude. Yeah. That yeah, shit it's, wrapped you know, around people's minds and makes them do something that they feel like crap about. That's how yeah. good they can get people. You know, that, that's, I'm, and like I said, I'm not targeting you. I just want to show no, like no, that's, that's, that's serious. That's mind control. To make oh, somebody absolutely. do something that they feel absolutely shitty about, but I have to do it or I'm going to go to hell. That's fucking horrible. And I'm so, yeah, I'm so sorry, uh, dude. No, no. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, when you, it was hard. Like, your heart would be racing, like, just driving to the Kingdom Hall because you know what you're facing. And, you know, you walk in. Not everybody knew what you did. Like, the elders do keep things confidential. Um, at least the majority, I believe the majority do. They're supposed to. Uh, but you know, word gets around, you know, for somebody who is affected by it, you know, they tell some, you know, any, any congregation of any religion, like there's gossip. And so, you know, (laughs) people know what you did and it's hard because there's people that will look like right through you. Like, even if you make eye contact with them, it's almost like you're, you're checking out a hot, (laughs) hot girl and and you just kind of, you look the other way and pretend like you did the work. It's kind of the same thing. Like people would do that and it's, I'm not mad at them for it. It's an awkward situation to be in um, because you don't really know how to take that. Mm. And so that my biggest thing was if somebody just smiled at me or like gave me a nod and acknowledged that I was there, like that made my day. That's all right. I wanted. Like, cause I well, wasn't course, expecting man. to talk to anybody and the rules. You're but, human. That's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely a dehumanizing thing to do to somebody and that's the biggest thing that i think messes with people's heads and and regardless like what it is like now regardless of the whole situation i mean now you're just a person you're doing the right thing you're not you know scumbag or anything like that and and you're going there to go you know i guess worship your god that you do look at as something being positive and these people make you feel fucking shitty for being there that's so horrible you know what I'm saying? No, and you know, yeah, people should not have rough. that's that's you know, I see that happening in other ways, you know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. and then in, in the world today, and it's just uh it's something that should not be happening. Yeah, you know, there is like the belief system is so ingrained into you that there were people on the outside, like people that I knew at work, or you know, people that I just, you know, met, you know, at a gathering or something, and um once you get to know somebody and they find out your situation, when you tell them, you know, right away, most people will tell you, bro, you're in a cult. That's a cult. What are you doing there? <laughs> and you would actually stand up and defend it. Well, no, they're doing it because, you know, what the members are told is you're doing this out of love because you want them to come back to Jehovah's organization so you have a chance to for everlasting life on earth. Because if you're not in it, you're basically viewed as the walking dead until you're reinstated. So to them, it's spun in a positive way. It's, you know, it's a momentary pain, but it's to bring them back to God is how they look at it. So that's how 
that's how deep the mind control is on on its members, on its believing members at least. I mean, listen, for yeah. years, for years, I did the same thing of people, you know, that maybe uh, might have been into like witchcraft, the Wicca, but not into like ceremonial magic or specific stuff like that. I, you know, I've mentioned to them that I was in the OTO and I had to defend it too. That was one of the first things that came out of their mouths. Like, yo, that's a cult. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I've had it said to me before. Yeah. And, and honestly, once I found out that you have to sign over your shit at the seventh or eighth degree, I mean, at my, in my opinion, it's a cult at that point anyway. You know, it's going yeah. to be a cult if you go high enough, you know. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. I've had to make I mean, the, especially, uh, some excuses. Especially, I, I don't know. Um, New York Patriot, if you went back to your lodge or anything sort of after you had put in your paperwork and stuff no. or even, cons- you know, expressed a concern that maybe you, we were having second thoughts or wanted to take a sabbatical or, or something. But I, I remember feeling a, a very similar way, but in a very small microchasm because it was not three years. But uh, I don't know how you did it, Jack. That's a that's a long time to feel as though. You're not getting the care and concern that you should be getting, and instead you're just being chastised. Uh, yeah, it was. It's hard because they also tell you not to associate with people outside of the organization. See, so that's, which that's I rough. I did like I had to for my sanity. Of course. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. friends you make at work because they tell you right now is your time to get close to God. It's just you and Jehovah now. So. But after they had told me that, I started thinking, I was like, well, if, if I can come back and have a relationship with God without you, why do I need to come back? Like, there that's something that goes through your head. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. eventually, ultimately, like, that's where I'm at now. It's, you know, I don't believe in a specific religion or church, but if you believe in God, it's going to be a personal relationship between you and, and whoever you consider God to be and just work on that. And very, so that's well that's how I live my life now. Very well said. Yeah. That's great. So I, th- I think actually we'll just leave it there. I think that's a good way to end this episode. And then now the next one, uh, we will be going into the research that we've all done with uh, pedophilia and occultism. Yeah. Obviously. All right. Awesome. So that's the end of another Cult Rejects. Please, if you liked it, please subscribe, share, pass it on. Uh, yeah. Check out our other stuff, too, if this is your first time hearing us. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later. See you.